Bonjour, uh, grüezi miteinander. Hello, everybody, and a warm welcome to the first event of its kind, a virtual bridge between Switzerland and Canada, and more specifically, the Quebec province. I am Rodica Rosefride, and I will be your host for this lunch or apero meeting, depending on your location. For our menu today, we have some distinguished leaders and guests with whom we are going to tackle the topic of gender equity in management. We are proud to bring together such a remarkable bunch of people as to trigger a fruitful discussion. Now, some of you might wonder why this topic again and again, as much has been said, read and heard about it in the last two months here in Switzerland. After the 50th anniversary of the Swiss Women's Suffrage and the Equal Pay Day in February, with the International Women's Rights Day in March, the media covered this issue more than ever. Well, despite all the talk and writings on gender equality, we have to face the facts. Although in recent years, women have made exceptional breakthroughs in politics, in a work context, they are still underrepresented in managerial positions. Did you know that the percentage of women on executive boards of the 100 largest Swiss employers has only risen to 10% last year? Why are we making so little progress? There is no straightforward answer to this question, as the subject is very complex. The search for viable solutions is just as difficult. Gender diversity is not a one-dimensional issue, but instead calls for the interplay of all involved parties. Swiss leaders, the Swiss Association of Managers, is acting as an enabler for the achievement of true gender equity in management by actively supporting projects and measures like Leaders for Equality Research and the A-Effect programs. As I have personally been working in the last two years with a Quebec company in the scope of LEFEA, I gained some knowledge of and have built a special relationship with this region, its people, and some of its representatives in and around Switzerland. Thanks to the Quebec government representation in Munich, who made this event possible today, Together with the Swiss Leaders Association, we set up a successful collaboration in a short time. We wanted to present a new and different way of dealing with this subject from the perspective of the two countries. But before getting into the issue itself, I would like to acknowledge the presence of the Minister for International Relations and La Francophonie and Minister for Immigration, Francization and Integration of Quebec Mrs. Nadine Giraud. Madame la Ministre, it is a great honor to welcome you. Well, thank you. Let me start first by saluting uh, the Quebec government representative in Munich, Elisa Valentin, the president and CEO of Hydro-Québec, Sophie Brochu, the president and CEO of CGE, George Chindler, director of enterprise customers at Microsoft Switzerland, Simone Puming, the head of Global HR Services and Labor Relations at ABB, Falker Cheffron, and the postdoctorate research fellow at the University of St. Gallen, Nilima Chowdhury, and dear guest. Good afternoon. I am really pleased to be with you today for this roundtable on gender equality in the, work for, in the workforce. As you know, gender equality is at the heart of Quebec's priorities, both at home and on the international stage. Issues related to pay quality, parity on the company boards of directors, and the inclusion of more women in an executive positions affect us all. Because equality, diversity, and interactions between diverse groups at all levels of companies and organizations provide a different perspective and contribute to innovation and collective enrichment. The whole society comes out a winner when more women enter places of power to be economic, political, or financial, and when they are 
remunerated fairly and treated, and treated equally. The whole society must likewise actively participate in achieving this equality. In this regard, Quebec is among the most progressive states and women are increasingly involved in the economic development. Let's think about the journey women have had in the past few decades. Women now accounts for 41% of all business owners, and this is 21% more increase since 1976. Today, female entrepreneurship in Quebec is currently growing three times faster, faster than male entrepreneurship. At this rate, there could be as many women as men heading companies in the next decade or so. Although significant progress has been made in recent years in Quebec, as you said before, gender equality still remains, especially so gender equality gap, I'm so, sorry, still remains, especially when we take a closer look at career paths and advancement. In terms of salaries, for example, the gender gap is continuing to narrow, but still in 2020, the average hourly wage of women was 91.8 of that of men. Women also still account for almost 62% of people working on part-time positions and nearly 58 of them are paid minimum wages. The Quebec government has been striving in increased gender equality for nearly 25 years. Strong measures and policies have been put in place to support women's employability and path career path. In Quebec, families can count on a subsidized network of childcare centers, providing low-cost childcare services, as well as a strong parental insurance plan. These policies have had a huge impact on women, getting them to be able to go back to work. Additionally, the Act Respecting the Governments and State-Owned Enterprises stipulates that as of 2011, all boards of directors of state-owned enterprises covered by the Act must include an equal number of women and men. As a result, on March 31st, 2019, 55.4% of the members of those boards of directors were women. Earlier, I said that the whole society has a part to play in women's advancement. Every single one of us every single one of our institutions, organizations, and companies can contribute. When I became Minister of International Relations, I wanted to do my part and have an impact on gender equality. In 2019, I made a personal commitment to achieve parity in Quebec's network of government offices ahead and heads abroad, and I'm very proud to have maintained this parity zone. There are currently 14 women heads of post, which represent 45% of the total number, including those heading the flagships delegation in Paris, New York, Boston, and Chicago, and of course, Munich, whose head of post, Elisa Valentin, is there with us today. I want to take this opportunity to underscore the work of the Quebec government office in Munich in building relations between Quebec and Switzerland in such priority areas as the economic recovery of our two states and the major issues we face, including the fight against climate change, the energy transition, and clearly gender equality. In order to attain true gender equality, in fact, men also have a role to play by speaking out in favor of equality between women and men, helping to break down sexual stereotypes stereotypes and working to change attitude and behavior. Gender equality is a social justice issue and the mobilization and involvement of men is paramount to it. In Quebec, she's a, a minister. It, you can hear somebody <laughs> talking. <laughs> In conclusion, I'm very proud that Quebec can join the, the Association Suisse des Cadres, Swiss leader organization for this round table, which is sure to be most re re rewarding, achieving true equality, in fact, between women and men in business and in all sphere of society will always be a collective responsibility. When we look at how we 
far we've been, we've come, recent de decades in Quebec, Switzerland, and elsewhere, we have very lots of reasons to be pleased. But there's still progress to be made in many issues, especially arising from the pandemic. Those issues will have an impact on achieving gender equality. That is why we must continue to bolster our efforts to reduce inequalities and injustices and aspire women to believe in themselves and their ability to hold position of power in businesses and in organizations. It is events like this today, which provide us with an opportunity to share views and best practices that enable us to, have, to help advance this cause. I encourage you to actively participate in the networking period that will take place following the roundtable. It will be your opportunity to forge lasting ties between Quebec and Switzerland. Thank you. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Ministre. Thank you for your presence and support. I know you cannot stay any longer, but no. uh, we are pleased to have Madame la Délégée Générale, uh, who will be with us for the rest of the evening. Thank you and uh, keep being inspiring and uh, we'll, uh, we'll go through uh, together uh, through this cause, uh, which is the equal, the equity uh, in management. Thank you. Thank you. Bonne journée. Au revoir. Merci. For the next part, I will hand over to our moderator, uh, Andrea Willman, who will introduce the guest and moderate the discussion. Andrea has had an international career abroad before she came back to Switzerland last year. And uh, she told me she was surprised to see and feel the conservative place women are still holding in society. While exploring the topic, she realized how the dialogue between men and women was uh, in a kind of broken. To encourage an open and honest conversation, she created the podcast Fish in the Boardroom, which she runs next to her professional activity and uh, looks at what individuals and organizations are doing on a very tangible basis to increase inclusion and diversity in a work context and in Switzerland in particular. Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Radhika. Well, also from my side, welcome to everybody to this Swiss Leaders Association Roundtable under the patronage of the government of Quebec. I think today no one can dispute that men and women should have the same opportunities. But studies still show that it remains difficult. And the 2020 WEF Global Gender Gap Report, for example, tells us that neither us nor our children will see gender parity in our lifetimes, as it will take another 100 years. And to address this, usually you see two common approaches. Either it's about fixing the women, changing the women, making them more prone to, to owning jobs in, in leadership positions. But there's also a second approach which says, talks about fixing the system. And the fixing the system requires men to be involved in this. And that's why today we're asking the question, how can men, male managers promote gender equality? For this discussion, we'll start with a little presentation by Nilima Choudhury. And she will present to us a study made by the University of St. Gallen looking at managers' commitment to gender equality. Nilima is a postdoc um, at the University of St. Gallen and she focuses on connections between gender, work culture and well-being. At the end of the, um, the discussion, we'll have some time for questions. So feel free to include your questions that you would have for our panelists or for Nilima in the um, in the chat box. The Alexia Berci, who's responsible for the German speaking part of Switzerland at the Swiss Leaders Association, will manage those questions and bring them up to the floor at the end of, um, of the presentation. So make sure to give her some work and, and ask many questions. And if you have your question for a specific panelist, do mention it as well. 
So with this, Nilima, I hand it over to you and uh, tell us more about how men and women perceive men's involvement in gender equity. Sorry, there was a little uh, confusion with that. Um, thank you very much, Andrea. Um, hello, everyone. Bonjour. Grüezi uh, miteinander. Buongiorno. I hope I included all languages. I'm very happy to have been invited to talk to you about the very important but often neglected topic of how to engage men in leadership positions for gender equity. So in the following, I will briefly introduce you to um, our research project, Leaders for Equality, Managers Taking Opportunities. So the main aim of our project was to support companies in involving male managers in gender equality activities. And also there's almost no empirical data on this topic so far. So we worked together with five project companies in Switzerland um, in the sectors retail, transport, insurance, electrical equipment, and medical technology. And the participation rate from these companies was between 30 and 50%, which um, showed us that it wasn't only those who are already interested in the topic that actually participated in the survey. It was also the first survey, both internationally and Swiss-wide, on this topic. And we collected um, responses from just under 1,200 managers. So the survey was about asking male managers about their own engagement in terms of gender equity and uh, female managers about how they perceive their male colleagues' involvement. In terms of participants, um, we had 69% uh, men and 31% women, which corresponds roughly to the uh, distribution in Switzerland. We had slightly more men participate. So I'm now going to introduce you to some of the key findings of our study. So why are men committed to gender equality? The top four reasons that were mentioned by male managers participating in the survey were, firstly, more role models within the company. Here it's unclear whether it's male or female role models. So are they referring to themselves? So do they want to include um, more women and, and have them in leadership positions to be role models? Um, and these were followed by um, fairness imperative, demographic change, and economic business success. So this sort of clearly shows us that gender equity is not a women's issue anymore, which is in itself a very positive finding. In terms of uh, reasons that were cited less by the male managers, um, these concerned mainly personal aspects, such as more difficult career for daughters and granddaughters or bad conscience. Interestingly, the women that participated in the survey, they believe that men are in fact motivated by these personal reasons, which raises the question of um, whether it might be less opportune for men to um, mobilize such personal aspects when they talk about gender equality. So this is something we want to explore in our follow-up project. So the bulk of the um, survey was based on the work of organization scholar Elizabeth Keelan and her work on gender inclusive leadership that you might have come across. Um, so practices that support the inclusion of all genders and do not encourage the exclusion of one gender. And our aim was to gain insights on whether participants were aware of these practices and whether they already implement these practices at work. So we divided um, these practices into three key aspects. Firstly, changing organizational and leadership culture. Secondly, making it easier for women and men to reconcile uh, family with work, career and leadership. And thirdly, support and encourage women. So, about a quarter of the male respondents reported that they already implement 12 out of the 22 measures. Other activities are implemented less, but are still conceivable, which again is a positive finding. However, keeping in mind that women saw men's engagement a little bit more skeptical, and we'll come back to this. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail. In terms of the first aspect, changing organizational and leadership culture, the three top items um, were not making any derogatory remarks, 
intervening in the event of derogatory remarks and paying attention to equal speaking opportunities. So to sum up, men pay attention to their own behavior and they intervene uh, when they see behavior that they don't find appropriate. Um, of all the different um, measures that we asked participants about, the activity that the majority of men uh, cannot uh, envisage doing is cancelling their participation in men-only rounds out of principle. And we think the main reason for this is that uh, the high male ratio in Swiss companies that Rodika mentioned in the beginning. As you are probably aware, 63 to 90 percent of top management positions in the 100 biggest companies in Switzerland are taken by men. So this seems to be a measure that is simply not feasible at this point in time. Second aspect, uh, reconciling work and family life. The two top items here were enabling mobile work and home office, as well as enabling part-time work and job sharing. And this possibly might be, at least in part, a, a corona effect. We also conducted group discussions with male and female managers and their evaluations of these measures were quite a bit more negative in these discussions. It is also unclear whether men see these as mostly relevant for women or their colleagues or also as relevant for themselves. It's important to look at uh, some of the sociodemographic differences between men and women that we found in our sample. So the majority of the men have families, work full time and have partners that work part time, which indicates that they don't have any firsthand experience um, of working part time themselves or of having partners that work full time and all the challenges that this can bring. So in our perspective, a change of perspective is needed. We need to see increasing the compatibility of family and career as a task for both men and women. Secondly, we need to establish part-time and job sharing as a new normal for both men and women. And thirdly, it's important for organizations to communicate family friendliness as a valuable asset, um, especially in terms of being an attractive employer. Last area we looked at was supporting and promoting women. So the top items here were intervening when competences are not respected, encouraging women to participate in leadership development programs, and shoulder tapping women who are suitable for leadership positions. Men also mentioned uh, that they would like to be more active in leadership, uh, pardon, in mentoring programs, but that currently they are not able to, which again indicates that organizations need to provide more opportunities for male managers to engage in such activities. There was an interesting gender discrepancy here. So one third of the women stated that they don't believe that men are trying to integrate women into male dominated circles. Only 7% of men saw this problem. This was also reflected in the overall finding that um, the male managers evaluated their organizations as more inclusive um, than the female managers. So that's another topic that is, would be interesting to explore. To wrap up, there are a few questions we can ask in terms of what men do and can do. Firstly, do men overestimate their commitment and play down difficulties? And or do women underestimate the commitment of men and what do they possibly not perceive and why not? And then following from this, what can men do more of how can their commitment become more visible, particularly to the women in their organizations? Interestingly, the main barrier that was named by both men and women was the perceived clash between the meritocracy principle and gender equity. Because gender equity initiatives make gender visible and bring it to the forefront, this is, however, a paradoxical finding because gender equity measures, of course, make gender visible to ensure a merit-based evaluation as opposed to a gender-based evaluation. So we think the goal must be to create more awareness of the different societal positions that men and women inhabit. This could also be seen in our sample. Um, on average, the female respondents 
are younger, have, are more likely to have tertiary education and international experience, are more likely to be childless and single, and rarely have partners who work part-time. So this indicates that care work is still, for the most part, women's work, which is one of the main barriers to applying the meritocracy principle because the starting conditions for men and women are so different. And as uh, Andrea mentioned earlier, uh, what is really important is that when we think about change, it needs to be defined as a process of organizational development instead of trying to change or fix women. My own research, I look at, as Andrea mentioned, the interconnections between workplace culture, gender, and well being. We know from a lot of empirical studies that women in leadership roles uh, face gender based challenges and disadvantages. And what I found in my research is that the coping strategies that women feel maybe pressured to use, that they are often geared towards making it work. In other words, that they keep the status quo intact. And that often leads to psychologically unsustainable work and leadership practices, which negatively affect women's well-being, which then in turn, of course, is a factor in explaining why women might not stay in leadership positions or might not achieve them in the first place, which is why I think including the well-being aspect in gender equity measures is really important. And we need to ask what can organizations and in particular male leaders do to support women. In general, our findings suggest that interventions should work towards building a common understanding between men and women, not only of the problem and the challenges, but also of the solutions, for example, in leadership trainings, workshops and coachings. This is our um, research team and I thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nilima, for these really interesting insights. And uh, before we go over to the panel, though, uh, the government of Quebec, who really appreciates your work, uh, has a little surprise for you. Uh, Elisa Valentin from the Quebec government representative in Munich. Will, uh, I'll hand it over to you to. Thank you. Thank you, dear Nilima. Um, I would like to congratulate you and the leaders for a quality team on this study. The findings you shared with us are the key uh, in the comprehension of the management environment and will help deepen our understanding of it. As we mentioned, there is still some work to be done in order to reach equality in the working environment. And I'm assured that your contribution will continue to give insights on how it can be achieved. So it is with great honor and pride that on behalf of the Quebec government, I'm offering you and a grant that will help you and your team continue your research on gender equality in organizations. So congratulations. Thank you very much. Uh, merci beaucoup uh, pour cette bourse. Uh, au nom de notre équipe de recherche et de l'Université de St. Gallen. Thank you very much. And I'm also very pleased because I actually have a very fond and personal connection with Canada. I lived there for three years and visited Quebec several times. So I'm very happy to be part of this event. And thank you very much for this grant. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everyone. And now I'm very curious to go over to, to our panelists and hear them uh, hear their thoughts. So with this, I, I'll um, introduce them, starting with uh, Sophie Brochu, who is president and CEO of Hydro-Quebec, the third largest hydropower producer in the world. She's also an a effect leader and a professional development program that was created in Quebec, but is also present in uh, Switzerland, as uh, Rodika also mentioned. We then also have uh, Simon Froming, who is Director Enterprise Customer at Microsoft Switzerland. And while looking a little bit into this well-known company, I read that the Microsoft employs about through its network organizations about 17% of the whole Swiss IT industry, excluding the hardware, which I thought was really interesting to see the impact of that company. Uh, we also have George Schindler, President and CEO CEO of CGI, a globally active Quebec-based IT consulting and system integrations company, and Falker Stefan, the head of global HR services and group head labor relations at ABB, a global Swiss-based electrical equipment company. 
So, une fois n'est pas coutume, uh, let's start with uh, men. And uh, I'd like to start with you, Volker. And here, I'm hearing these um, results from, from uh, Nilima, and I'm wondering why are you committed to gender equity? And what do you think of women's assessment uh, towards men's uh, involvement? Well, first of all, thanks, Andrea, for, for giving me the chance to kick this off here. I think, from my point of view, it's really from an organization perspective. I mean, diversity clearly is a differentiator if you want to be successful in, in, in the today's world you know, as an organization. If you want to drive innovation, diversity and also therefore gender diversity is just imperative that you need to guarantee. For that reason, and also obviously, when you just look at our values, uh, hopefully that we all share. I mean, it's just for fairness reasons. I think that is something that I could very well with me also, where I just truly believe that we need to also give equal opportunities, both from development, but obviously also basic things like compensation, stuff like that to people. I mean, everybody can say I'm from HR, so definitely it's my... <laughs> It's my job kind of to, uh, to give equal opportunities to all talents. And I was fighting for decades for that and also challenging myself what I can do differently. So coming to the question whether we do enough as men, I think honestly, I think we do not do enough. Yes, maybe if we are asked, uh, all of us will say same for instance as with uh, climate, uh, uh, for instance, contributing to a better uh, overall global warming or uh, reducing global warming and the, the overall climate. I think all of us say we contribute, but in fact, we don't do enough. And I think it's very much the same also with the female. Uh, females, where I would say, if you ask men, yes, we will all say, yes, we do enough, or we do a lot, maybe not enough, but I think we do not. George, what is uh, your reaction to this? Yeah, thank you, uh, Andrea, and thank you for having me here. Um, so I, I wasn't, uh, unfortunately, maybe, I wasn't that surprised at all by the, uh, the results, much like uh, Volker just said. Uh, this has uh, been going on for years, and uh, maybe the lack of trust between, uh, between men and women, um, it took time to get to where it is now, and it will take time to correct. But that can't be an excuse for men not to take action, I think uh, correctly so from the study, I think it's why men have to be proactive and take a, take a, a, a real action uh, oriented approach to this. Um, but you know, if, if you think about why this is so important to a company like CGI, we're in the services industry and uh, we have a core value of respect, uh, respect for each of our stakeholders, including our communities, but respect, you have to model that respect. You have to model that respect within your own company and, uh, and respect of, of people of all genders, races, et cetera. And, uh, and so it's a core value of CGIs and uh, that's why it has to be uh, approached from the top uh, and, uh, and it has to then permeate the entire organization. And so uh, I think it's very important. The other interesting uh, reaction I have, and, and maybe we can explore this uh, in, in a little bit, uh, but I think the, the, the point that, um, that uh, somehow this works against the, uh, the meritocracy approach, it's, it, it's really the opposite. And uh, I think the organizations have to be, promote that, particularly men. So to the women now, do women underestimate it, the, the commitment of men? Maybe starting with you, Simone? Mm, I I wouldn't say that uh, so much. I think um, if you're growing up from from your university up to a leadership career, I think you're always working with with males, and uh, I would say in general with with a certain mix, it's it's obvious that there's a limited uh, amount of women which is really growing up. But as always in life, it depends, and I'm a big believer in mentorship. So, and I think women, we had really had the luck to, to have a strong male mentor. I think they were even really promoted if the overall percentage of women was low. So I would say it's also yeah, dependent who is helping you really to accelerate and grow. But overall, it's not enough. I agree. Sophie, what are your thoughts? 
Well, first, uh, I want to say to Nelima that uh, your uh, study is absolutely uh, fascinating, and I would be uh, intrigued and, and quite uh, interested in a cross study with the Quebec society uh, itself, how it compares with uh, Switzerland from the difference of how men perceive women and, and vice versa in what we're trying to do. Um, uh, I do believe with Simone uh, uh, that uh, I, I agree with you, Simone, that uh, uh, we need more mentors. I think one of the gap is a language and communication gap, and, and it goes to the unconscious bias. Um, Sometimes uh, men will say, well, I, I, I make a specific effort in mentoring a woman, uh, but the way they mentor a woman will be different than the way they mentor a man. And sometimes it's okay and it's fine, but it's just the color uh, that they put on it, or at least the color that the woman perceived that they put on it might be just a matter of, of really uh, perception. I am a big believer of sponsorship. I think we have mentors, Simone here in my neck of the wood, uh, and with the uh, A effect in Quebec and how we deploy uh, in Europe, but um, what we need often, and, and it was my case, and it still is the case, is for a man to put his hand on my head and say, she's good. And when you speak to her, it's like if you were speaking to me. This goes a long, long way in the career of a woman. Um, and uh, I think women need that more than men, because, because when a man says she's really good for a reason or another, it must be right, right? So. <laughs> It's uh, that's it. a, a mentor talks to somebody, a sponsor talks about somebody, and I think we need both, uh, but we need sponsors. And 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 uh, I can only welcome the fact that we have two men uh, with us today. We've spoken among ourselves enough. It's a society issue, and uh, so it's it it's a great uh, kickoff, I believe, between Quebec and Switzerland on that front. Any reactions from your side, Falk or, or George, like this strong request for, for sponsorship? How do you handle that? Yeah, I, I really like the way, Sophie, you put that uh, speaking to a woman versus speaking about a woman. So at CGI, one of the things that we've done is we put in place very objective criteria. That criteria, for, and this is for promotions into uh, leadership positions, and that's published for everybody to see. And, uh, and then uh, to, the, to the study's point, we, we do not allow just people to apply who thinks that they uh, met that criteria, uh, because what we've learned is that uh, a man might have five out of the 10 criteria and raises his hand, and a woman might have nine out of the 10 criteria and says, well, I'm, I'm still missing one piece of the criteria. So first is having the objective criteria, but we didn't think that was far enough. And so we made a, an effort and says, we have to have a diverse slate of candidates. Still pick the best candidate, but we have a diverse slate. And just by doing that, uh, we are now talking more about uh, women, not just to women, because we actually, they go through the process. They learn through that process, just like in, quite, in fact, men got the benefit of raising their hand if they only had five or 10, even if they didn't get selected. And so my reaction to Sophie is uh, right on. It's, uh, it's mentoring and coaching are great and we have a lot of that, but, uh, but really there's, there's nothing like going through the process, forcing a, a diverse slate, but then still sticking to objective criteria. Everybody benefits when we do that that way. Yeah, maybe from my side, I wonder always, I mean, the mentoring programs we had for quite some time, I always look about the interventions that we did and how fruitful they were and how powerful. And yes, I mean, I think mentoring can definitely be also together with the sponsoring there, would uh, sponsorship, I would agree with Sophie, would be definitely something that can help. But nevertheless, I think we need to be much more bold on, on some of the interventions that we do. And, and, and be, I mean, they are the traditional solution, I think, that many companies have. I was also asking myself, for instance, how can we, for instance, as ABB, where we have mainly electrical engineers, and you look at that at the number of female graduates from universities, you're really struggling with uh, get, getting already the talent pipeline into the company, and how maybe we can also look at uh, different solutions, like do we really need to engineer a degree, for instance? Mm -hmm. Is it maybe roles that uh, we are thinking in the past that we need to engineer a degree, but we actually don't? 
Or maybe do we have uh, females and actually we do have females in, in, in functions where we have a high, higher percentage of females not having studied electrical engineering, but then for instance, we talked to the EDH here in Switzerland for quite some years to come up with a program that is similar to an MBA just for master of technology in order to allow uh, female talents, mainly that was our ambition at least, and it's not only for females, uh, the ETH, ETH told us, but for us, the intention was mainly for females to open new career path also to them to get to technology. And it's not here about really the detailed electrical engineering, it's more a broad understanding of the industry and the application side of it to also open up career paths to these kind of females who now know and understand what ABB is doing and feel quite attracted by our portfolio and our customers in this technology and also would like to take over more general management responsibility. So I think it's that kind of new paths that we need to take. Uh, and I think there the challenges definitely are different depending on the industry, which we need to go. And in addition to mentoring and sponsoring and making sure that we also have, uh, like also George said, a really kind of diverse uh, talent pipeline. Simon, I think um, in the preparatory discussions, you told me as well that uh, that you go also beyond all of the, all of this, and and you're you're working working with with managers and the way they communicate in their in their teams. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So uh, before I'm doing that, I have also to, to agree on, on Volker, of course, um, what I perceived also in this leadership perspective that plenty of female leaders then started in HR and probably finance, but less also with full P&L responsibility. And I think that's improving now, but I think that's also something we really should enforce together with males also to hire talent in, in the full P&L responsibility. Yeah, and uh, looking in, into Microsoft, um, I think I'm, I'm a sales leader with a full P&L and I'm eager really to develop female talent. And from that perspective, I'm also super busy with my management team really to coach them how they really can help uh, having females growing. Of course, for example, I think it's a, bit, a little bit <laughs> uh, simplified, but I perceive, especially in our world of digital sales, that you need a lot of creativity really to find customer solutions. So, and sometimes you see that I think females are bringing a good talent of creativity and my male leadership team is not feeling comfortable really to let that flow in the hierarchical setup. So, and I'm really spending a lot of time in, in growing up the first leadership female leaders with coaching of my leadership team really interfering in this coaching session and really always to balance how they are reacting, what they're really developing with the females and what I see as a female is really needed to give more confidence to potential female leaders. And uh, I think that's also surrounded with, with a strong cultural va value in Microsoft of diversity and inclusion. So beside what I'm telling my managers, there's also a regular feedback on a quarterly basis based on this uh, diversity and inclusion index so that they're also getting yeah, pretty good feedback, what their employees are thinking, what is the overall picture. And I think that's really helping a lot also for organizational development. Sophie, you are uh, also an FAA leader and uh, you've been following this for, for quite a, a, a while from the inside and from the outside. Can you tell us a bit about what that has done in, uh, in your, what ha you have observed about the effect of this? Well, I have observed that uh, um, actually when I compare Switzerland, France, Quebec and, and, and the rest of North America, the impediments of women are almost the same. We're not at the same stage, but the impediments that belongs uh, that belong to women are almost the same. And the impediment that belong to the companies are almost the same. So to the extent that we can unknot some of the things that are, uh, you know, the hurdles, uh, you, you can achieve velocity, you can solve uh, issues by issues, 
as I grow with the, uh, the women that we've coached through the years and now with thousands and thousands of women, it is clear that it, it, it really is a matter of, of a society that wants to get better. The individual wants to get better, the companies want to get better, the society wants to get better. Nilima touched a, a very important point in the survey about the family thinking. We've been thinking women, family, man, work. We need to be thinking family, work, man, women. And if you want to keep the young men as allies to the young women, they need to find themselves the ability to embrace family and be respected in doing so. And still in France, if you're an executive VP uh, and you say, I need to pick up my son at 4.30 at kindergarten, you're looked at like, uh, who are you? You know, in Quebec, you will have an executive of a, of a financial institution who will say that, that's fine, and come back. It's, so I'm not saying Quebec is better than France. I'm just saying we're not at the same stage yet. My personal belief is that the, 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 the equality in the workplace means the equality at the home place. And if one company helps a young m and guy uh, in his career somewhere at 4.30 to go and pick up the kids because his wife or his partner is working uh, in a lawyer's firm and she has to work. If a company helps a young man to pick up a kid, the company is helping a girl at another company having a career. So we need to have a very holistic way of thinking about our society. That said, we need to be quantitative. I was fortunate enough for a few months before I had to take on a job to sit on the CGI board. And I learned a great sentence that George would keep saying, what, what gets measured and visible gets advanced. We measure a lot of things, but we don't make it visible. If a CEO or a leader or a manager says, that's my goal, I'm going to be driven this, equality is important for me, I'm giving myself a target and keeps talking about it and show the result, it, we move forward. When it sticks to, it's important, it's great, we wanna do better, we're in the mud. So it's a, it really is something as a, as, as a society and equality at the workplace starts with equality at the home place. What are your reactions to this? Maybe with a, your experience, maybe in Switzerland, ABB or Microsoft, is this things that would, would happen in your, in your companies that a man would leave the office early to pick up uh, their kids? So I think for, for Microsoft, it's, it's very common. Of course, uh, even with uh, below 1,000 employees in Switzerland, we have 41 different nations. And uh, a lot of employees coming from the Nordics who joined in Switzerland. And for them, it's super common to leave at four and to, to work again from, from eight. So that, that was uh, role modeling it. But in general, that's also part of the company. And um, yeah, we are virtual even before COVID. So a lot of things happening out of the home office. So the visibility or the day-to-day -day, uh, interaction, I think it was maybe different already than in typical Swiss companies. Yeah, and for ABB, I would say also, I mean, a lot what helps is our, our cultural diversity. We have in Switzerland more than 80 different cultures working together in ABB. So that certainly helps. <clears throat> we also promote quite early on, we're the first company to have this childcare center. Not only for women, I would say that it's also <laughs> for men. Regardless if you're a man or a woman, you can bring your child there. And also we also pick it up, obviously, your child. Um, but I think, uh, you know, of all I had a chance, I just was reflecting myself. I, I reported in the past to three women. I mean, uh, three bosses, female bosses. And, and, and one of them, uh, she was the, uh, in, a, in a senior position in, in Switzerland also, and I reported to her, a general management position, and she got pregnant and she took off six months. And the press was all over her. 
saying that how can a CEO take off six months for maternity leave? And I think there the problem starts. And I think also that is something that really you could see the organization saying, no, 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 come on. I mean, we need to exactly allow for that because there needs to be, I mean, this is something a man cannot take over, right? But uh, yes, a man can also share. He, obviously we share also maternity leave. We just had paternity leave. Now being also as one of the companies in Switzerland, far beyond uh, the, 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 the legal requirement to introduce. So I think exactly it's like, I, I think I would fully agree with Sophie, what she said uh, about looking what kind of society we're in, trying to, to bring that equality also there and, and also man, father, mother, I think this kind of role needs to be much more mixed. And I think I wouldn't say we are everywhere there. I think it's also maybe depending on the, the background, social background that people have, but I think we, we, we came a long way and I'm quite positive on that, that it becomes more and more accepted. But isn't it that many companies now, large companies tend to offer uh, paternity leaves that are longer than the legal requirement, which in Switzerland since this year is two weeks, um, by the way. Um, <laughs> that, so even companies that, that offer more of, of it, um, that oftentimes men don't take it. So how are they encouraged to, to take that leave of absence so that, as Sophie says, you can be more present at home? So if I answer again for Microsoft Switzerland, I think we have so many role models this time. Of course, in the last uh, two years, I think we had about 30 men really taking paternity leave. So that's nothing cultural wise to be ashamed anymore. And um, I think they're also sharing what, what they really experienced, um, how strong was the day to day with, with, the, with, with the babies. So I think it's with such a positive mindset that that's the new normal. And I think that's really changed within two years where we had enough examples so that it really became common. And I have to say also from my side, I mean, it's, I'm not the biggest one always looking at and differentiating between generations, but I think here's really a generational issue also a topic that kicks in. And, and I think the new, gen, the younger generations uh, have less of an issue, but I think also it's more and more and more accepted. Uh, it's also the question how you deliver work and, and how you perform and how flexible you can arrange also your career, for instance. And I think there is a lot, a lot has changed. So I, and we have four weeks, for instance, of paternity leave, uh, and people obviously can also take longer off uh, paid leave. So let's see. I mean, just introduce that longer one. I'm, it will be interesting to see how many are taking that, but I'm, but I'm very positive that people will. I think the other thing, Andrea, is, is providing forums to have the discussion and to share the stories. Because if you don't, if, if somebody in one corner of the organization doesn't know that there's 40 men that this was uh, available to, they may feel less willing to do it. And I think having that open forums, truly open forums helps this uh, trust factor that uh, was identified. Uh, I'll call it a trust factor where uh, may maybe men and women perceive things differently. Uh, I think having that open forum, a truly open forum and having that discussion and men quite frankly play a bigger role in that because uh, I think men have to be far more proactive and uh, you asked me this question uh, earlier. I think uh, men need to listen more and not be defensive, but actually listen. And then when they take the action from what they heard, not be so afraid to make a mistake because we will. We're gonna say something wrong, we're gonna do something wrong. But if we actually listened and were honest about it and genuine about it, uh, I think that actually goes a longer way than just sitting back and waiting for somebody to ask you to mentor somebody or ask you to be on a, on a panel. I think if we're more proactive, which means we're gonna make some mistakes and that's just reality. Sophie, in our preparation discussions, you mentioned that women need to listen more. Yes, actually it's quite fascinating. Well, the conversation is both way. I think, uh, uh, Yes, sometimes we need to listen more because sometimes we have indications uh, that we don't grasp, that we don't, you know, and uh, sometimes the indications would need to be a bit clearer, but sometimes we need to be, uh, to be listening to the, uh, the drum beat that somebody uh, sends uh, to you. 
So um, I, I think the, the meaning of the world sometimes is not the same in the head of a woman and the head of a man, speaking exactly the same language, S coming from the same company. Uh, the resonance will 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 be uh, will be different. Let, let me give you a very contemporary contemporary uh, uh, theme: uh, working from home. We all learn to work from home, just like that, all across the planet. And now the companies are devising how it's going to work. You know, in the future, is it going to be all 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 work or three and two days and blah blah. One of the big my fear my uh, my fear right now is the trap that women can fall into. And the trap being, you can work from home almost all the time. Because men will go to work in the office and the women will stay home. And we will have meetings like this. And you know, when everybody is at home, it's one thing. When everybody's in the office, it's one thing. But when you will be like that, we will have a meeting. The screen will close. The, off, the people in the office will keep talking, make a decision, and you at home will be left out of it. So, and I believe that because of a, a good a goodwill, a bienveillance, how do we say bienveillance in English? Uh, uh, because they want to be uh, to be good to women. Well I think, but it, yeah, well-being. They will tend to be very accommodating. Let's make sure we don't accommodate more women than men, <laughs> because uh, because we will go back in time for very good driving and reasons. And, and there, this is where I talk to women and I say, watch out, watch out. And they say, shit, sorry, shit, I hadn't thought about that. But that's, that's really, it, it's really an issue uh, that we will need. So the companies themselves will need to make sure that women are not auto excluding themselves from the arenas of influence that we have worked so hard to build. Yep. Thank you. Um, I think I'm seeing the, the time we're slowly getting, uh, getting ahead. And so my question is to Alexia, do you have any questions from the panel? Yeah, we have a, a very interesting discussion going on and I think we have a short opportunity to answer a few questions. And uh, one interesting question is um, if you uh, have quotas in your companies, who has quotas? So I'll start here. We do not have a quota. Uh, and it goes back to the, the point about, um, about making sure that we maintain the meritocracy. But we do have a target for us to get to the same representation at all levels of the company. And as Sophie said, we make that very visible. We talk about that. But we stay away from the word quota so that we don't uh, create that distrust and that we really do have the objectivity that we have. We also believe that if you're providing everybody the opportunity, it will be very easy for us to get there. And that's why we publish without having a strict quota for any one promotion at any one point in time. A little bit different. So I'm seeing Volker, uh, Simon, at uh, your companies, there is uh, a quota. And, and Sophie, at your company, I didn't quite catch it. There's not. We're like, we're like CGI. We have targets, we have goals, uh, and we make it visible. Okay. So maybe yeah, you want to... the question, what is a quota, what is a target? Mm -hmm. We have a target, for instance, also for different, for instance, in leadership positions. We have a target for also how many want to hire females from uh, graduates. So these kind of targets, obviously. And in Microsoft, it's similar. If we are hiring, um, we have to have a, two final candidates, one a female and one a male. And there's a very limited exception process to, to move around that. And uh, you also have a clear hiring target. If you have 10 open positions, at least you have to hire 20% females. How much? 20%. 20 so and it's clear also if you're going into the engineering perspective or other areas, it's more difficult. Of course, the talent pool is also not that um, big, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, is easier to do in Switzerland than it is at least because I have global roles, for instance, US. We try to implement something like that and you uh, hit uh, some roadblocks from the legal side because you start discriminating. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and this is where, anyway, this is why we have so much work to do. <laughs> we have a lot of work to do and, and, and we have work to do with young men also because young men, if they don't feel part of the overall global societal strategy, um, you know, that will create uh, uh, friction, which we don't need, which we don't want, which, which is not uh, what we're trying to achieve. But um, no, 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 uh, no quotas. And we, uh, uh, we know, I think quotas are more uh, uh, the norm now in Europe, right? And, and on boards and things like that. And there are some industries who are more advanced, I think. I think uh, they are industries who have the business model of iceberg derivating to the north, to the South Seas and they don't, they're, they're not in 2021. Um, I do believe that reality will catch them up. Um, but the idea is not to have, uh, to have people penalized. We, the idea to have, is to have better people, better companies, but better society. So it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a global issue, but it's a global opportunity. I quota, we could have a panel discussion just on this topic, I think. Yes. <laughs> so uh, so uh, maybe, Alex, I'll, I'll open to one more question and then we'll close this. Uh, perfect. Another interesting question. Um, how do you think the pandemic have already impacted the gender inequality and how will it impact it in the long term? Well, I've shared my piece on that. Anyone else? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it goes back a little bit, I guess, what we see is sometimes is the modeling of the family at home, because we have many, unfortunately, women who more take care of the, the kids and then they cope with two jobs, if you like, uh, at the same time. And it really depends on how they are organized at home. We see some families where it works well and some where it doesn't work well. Honestly, I'm less concerned with us, for instance, that they will, and also we do not encourage by gender or any way uh, to stay home and not to stay home. I think we're gonna have an, a very flexible model. There will be people, especially now after two years, you can say it's been a second year more than one year now people working from home, especially in Europe where it's quite strict. So you see also my artificial background because I'm working from home. <laughs> and and uh, at the end, I think many, many people are looking to come back and I would, I would not see a gender difference there. Yeah, I no, think that, we have to be, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, no, go please. ahead, George, sorry. Okay, I think we need to be very conscious as Sophie said, how we come out of this. I think going into it has done a lot of good quite frankly, at least in, uh, in our industry, uh, allowing people to be, allowing us and our clients to be more flexible. Uh, I think that's been, uh, that's been a positive for both men and women. I think men to your, your blending of family and work and work and family and men and women. Uh, I've sp spoken to a number of executives, uh, male and female that have appreciated the time that they've had to spend with their families, particularly my male uh, colleagues around the globe. And, uh, and I think, you know, if we come out of this the right way uh, and don't just slip into the old ways of doing work, which as Sophie said, could be even more damaging because uh, we maybe accommodate uh, women more than men. But if we allow men to have that same flexibility and truly allow for a hybrid situation, I think this could actually uh, accelerate uh, some of what we've been talking about here today, if we do it right. And we got to be very conscious about it mm -hmm. collectively. And if I can add on it, for me, it was also a little bit gender neutral. But I think also for new hires and in general, it was really a learning for virtual networking. Mm -hmm. So and I think that is a competency which can help uh, also females afterwards, and for sure, as well, as well for males. But I think it was really accelerating virtual networking. And that's a super competency for any kind of, of development. Yeah. Thank, thank you, everyone, for these really interesting uh, insights. What I'm taking away from our discussion is, is that we need to listen to each other more. So men le need to, to listen more, but women as well. And that will help. And that also, it all starts at home. And that more equality at home will, in the end, really be the, the driver of, uh, of, of impact in uh, in gender in gender equity thank you everyone
Radhika, I mm -hmm. hand it back to you. Thanks, Thank you. Andrea, and a big thank you, dear guests, for your commitment and generosity in, in sharing your enlightened opinions. As for you, dear listener, I hope you have enjoyed the discussion and live out with many ideas on what you can do to be part of the solution. On our side, after empowering male managers to advance gender equality on a corporate level, a further event, Switzerland, Quebec, will highlight women in leadership positions in local industry. We will talk about how they succeeded in breaking the, breaking the, the glass ceiling and how they are taking action to enable more women to reach executive positions. So save the date, rendezvous on May 10th for a webinar in French. And now, before concluding this second part of the meeting, one final word on behalf of the Swiss Leaders Association from, the, from its managing director, Mr. Jörg Eggenberger. Jörg, many thanks for your support in organizing this event. And uh, I give you the floor for the closing. Yes, thanks a lot, uh, Rodika, and uh, thanks uh, also to the panelists and uh, their contribution and insights. I think it was a, a very interesting um, discussion we had and um, uh, very valuable contributions for, for, for also how we can promote um, um, the, the whole equality issue. I just want to point out that um, the Swiss leader uh, is a cooperation partner and on the advisory board of this uh, research project and we also um, um, our, our members also participated in this um, survey and uh, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm very um, convinced that we have to follow both ways one of which is obviously to promote women and to get uh, in leadership positions and obviously the a effect program is, is, is a very good program in order to um, let women discover their talents, standing by their ambitions and advancing their careers. And I think the second approach is uh, really as important is for men to care more about equality. And I think what really came out with the, um, uh, the presentation we had with uh, Nilima is, is that uh, it's a per perception issue. I mean, men think that they do a lot and women think they don't do enough. So <laughs> I think the main issue is that uh, we get into a dialogue that we really question our mindsets and that we also are prepared to suspend our um, assumptions and, and facilitate this dialogue, even if it's sometimes perhaps for men rather boring because it's always the same issue for them but i think it's it, it's very important that we we keep up and we 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 we, we continue to um, um really share our different perceptions and 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 and, and um, make this equality happen so thanks a lot all of you for participating and for you rotica and andrea Ullmann also for the moderation and of course a special thanks also to the state of quebec for supporting this event. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Jörg, and your entire team. And last but not least, I would like to thank all of those who contributed behind the scenes of this event. And I would like to thank Elisa Valentin. Yes. Du Québec à Munich. Sorry, as well as Veronique Aimé and Shannon Limay. Sorry, I don't, yes. And I would like to thank uh, Alexia Berchi and Claire Liz Rima, the co directors of SKO ASC. And I would like also to thank John Gallagher, co founder of LFEA, for their precious help.